dogs have been on TV since TV first began. But did you know that until recently, dogs could not see TV? A look at Isle of Dogs with Alexandra Horowitz of Barnard's Dog Cognition Lab, ahead on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley, and I'm very happy to be joined by Professor Alexandra Horowitz of the Dog Cognition Lab at Barnard College. Welcome, Alexandra. Thanks, Faith. I, I think there are a million people watching. Well, I hope there are a million people <laughs> watching this, but there are people watching this thinking, dog cognition? I can be a dog scientist? Right. Well, apparently now one can. When I began my career, there was no kind of dog cognition science. But Are you the founder? <laughs> well, I'm the founder of my lab. Um, wow. Yeah, I, I began it about a decade ago because I was doing research related to dog cognition. That field was evolving, people looking at dog behavior and trying to make inferences about what dogs know and understand. And there was a lot of interest in it. And so now I work with students at Barnard and we do research. And by students, you mean dogs. No, um, actual wish. people. Um, is that a veterinary science background or neurological? Or? Not at all, right. Cognitive science. Cognitive so science. interested in cognition from a neuroscience, behavioral, psychology, philosophy perspective. How do you get answers to the questions about what we know and how we come to know it and what non-human animals know and understand? And that was really my interest in studying non-human animals. And I just wound up kind of accidentally, really, with, with dogs as my population. But now they're, they're a good population to study, and I love to study them. We are going to talk about dog movies today, starting with Wes Anderson's new flick, Isle of Dogs. We get the idea. You're looking for your lost dog spots. Does anybody know it? No. no. I've lost all of my pride. Spots, if he's alive, may very well be living even at this moment as a captive prisoner. Somebody is up to something. Will you help him? The little pilot. Why should I? Because he's a 12-year-old boy. Dogs love those. We'll find him. Wherever he is, if he's alive, we'll find your dog. Okay, so Alexandra, these dogs are going to take on this dangerous mission because this little pilot is a 12-year-old boy and dogs love those. And, you know, in real life, it does, it does seem like dogs and kids are made for each other. Is that kind of scientifically true? Well, I would say dogs and humans are made for each other, absolutely. Sometimes kids are bizarre humans, right, and don't act as predictably, <laughs> and, and they're not as easy to get along with for, for animals. But I think... From the other side, um, children really have an affinity for non-human animals and in many ways are much more empathetic. So there can be a, a, a special kid-dog bond. It, it's interesting that you say that, that I guess kids can be unpredictable, so dogs maybe stake out their space. But my th I have two kids. My, I don't think my five-year-old son notices dogs, but my three-year-old daughter notices dogs everywhere. And maybe it's because she's almost she's basically at their height, right? But you walk down the streets, we're in New York, and she, she's learned, she has to ask if she can pet someone's dog, and she puts out her hand and it sniffs, but she will not pass a dog without petting it. Yeah. I mean, I think we, as humans, have a little bit of a compulsion, which we eventually kind of suppress, to touch furry creatures, especially friendly I furry don't. creatures. I don't. And, I, and people have told me that makes me a bad person. <laughs> I find dogs, I find lots of animals adorable. Yeah. But I don't, like, uh, am I just anomalous that I am not programmed to want to, you're so cute, you're so cute, to no, every dog I, I think, see? I don't think you're, you know, they're not a singular exception. Okay, good. But I do think that as a species, humans do respond to certain features in non-human animals, which are appealing to us. And in fact, Conlon the Wrens, this uh, great ethologist of the 20th century, thought that the features were neotenous features, features that babies have, that big humans eyes. are big eyes, big forehead, chubby cheeks, you know, the jowls kind of mimic. Drooling. Yes. <laughs> big, big feature, big head relative to body. Yeah. Um, 
that actually compel humans a little bit to take care of, to have an urge to take care of. Not every example of that, of that um, feature, but at least some examples of that feature. And dogs have been domesticated or have evolved, both those things happening at once, to take on some of those characteristics which humans as a species seem to have um, an affinity toward. So, all right, those are some reasons why, why we might love dogs. Why do dogs love humans? It's a great question. I mean, I think that socially, dogs are um, a social animal. You know, dogs and their ancestors, which were wolf-like creatures, live in packs, live in family packs. And there are things about the dogs that changed in domestication that made them less fearful of humans, but they still want to live in a family pack structure. And they're happy in a family pack structure. They're responsive to other members of that family. Um, and then on top of that, we have suppressed their urge or need, certainly, to do a lot of things that wild animals need to do to survive, to find shelter, to hunt. Um, and so we're taking care of all those. We're the social unit. Suddenly, they'll fit with us. I mean, they could live among each other around us and not in our families, but we're a pretty good deal for a yeah. dog. Yeah. I mean, we literally pick up their crap. Absolutely. I sometimes wonder if the dogs think, Who's you know, got the that leash? We're, they yeah. are the kings. <laughs> wolves don't love us. No. Dogs love us. Wolves don't love us. I think that's fair to love say. Love us, right? Yeah. In pop culture, gothic tales, and of course, video games love the idea, though, of a rebel hero and, and his or her pet wolf. In Game of Thrones, each of the Stark kids had a d pet dire wolf. Um, I have a, a dire wolf uh, Christmas ornament, mm -hmm. in fact. Um, but here's a question. Why couldn't you raise a cute little wolf puppy from birth and then yeah. go take your adolescent wolf for a nice walk in Central Park? Why wouldn't that work? Well, they are really not dogs in any way. I mean, because we call them both Canis, we think, well, Canis lupus, Canis familiaris, they're close. They share a common ancestor, but they're at least tens of thousands of years divergent in evolution. And there have been researchers um, in Hungary first, in Budapest, who wanted to see what happens if you kind of enculturate a wolf. In fact, if you take wolves into the house, raise them from puppies, treat them like dogs, you know, do they become a dog? And the answer is they change in some ways, but they don't become a dog. They're not, we would call it not tractable. In other words, sort of manageable. The way the dogs have suppressed this urge to jump on everything, that they are not as attentive to our faces. Dogs are attentive to our faces and wolves are not. Wolves don't have any of those suppressed urge to jump on anything. They grab food where they see it. They run where they want. They're not responsive to the human in the same way. So they get big. They're just um, wolves that have suffered being uh, have a collar put on their neck mm. and a leash put on the collar. That's it. So it's Canis lupus right, is right. wolf, canis familiaris, sounds right, very right. sweet, is a dog. Yes. Do all dogs as we know them come though from a wolf ancestor? It's a wolf-like ancestor. In fact, some people call canis familiaris canis lupus familiaris, but the wolves we see now and the gray wolves in, in Yellowstone and the wolf in Central Park um, are both descendant of some other wolf-like ancestor that doesn't look like either of them. And then all the, all the many different species we have of dogs yes. come from a common ancestor? Oh yeah, all breeds of dogs are relatively recent, actually, They're the divergence. So different looking. It's the morphological and in some cases behavioral differences are really profound, I think more than any other animal among these breeds. And that's because we've done, humans have done selective breeding. People have said we want, here's a large dog that seems to bark when there's something in the forest. We want to mate that dog with another dog like that. And then you start getting large dogs. You know, they're dogs who are adapted to certain environments where they need a, f a thicker undercoat. There, there have been for many, at least a thousand years, lap dogs. People like to have a dog that could fit on your laps. And they're going to mate that, not with that really big dog or the right. really furry dog, but with another dog that's small. And so that's differentiation by morphology and sometimes by behavior, a good guarding or herding dog led to the beginnings of breeds, but it's only been since the 19th century 
that we've really done selective breeding for the hundreds of breeds that we see today. So recent. It's extremely recent. Were the Hungarian wolf dogs selected to fight vampires, do we think? <laughs> I mean, they're probably wolf dog hybrids through the ages. I mean, dogs have been domesticated many times at different places. But this was a time when in America and in England um, in, the, in the 19th century, people decided they wanted to kind of perfect dogs. Um, it was right around the time in human psychology of eugenics when people are like, you know, races are very different. They're importantly different in, in intelligence is what people thought then mistakenly. And at the same time, people thought, I want to get like the perfect German shepherd. I want to get the perfect um, bird dog, sort of a spaniel dog. And they started interbreeding dogs that were, um, looked very similar and then only breeding dogs from those um, progeny so that you have an interbred closed breed line where you're not getting any examples from outside of the breed. And that really leads to strong differentiation of a very distinct German Shepherd dog and a, you know, a field spaniel all the way down to the Chewini that we have now. In the movie Isle of Dogs, there are five alpha male dogs, Chief, Rex, King, Duke, and Boss, all in one pack. Wasn't that supposed to be impossible? That that every you know every pack had to have a single alpha male right, leader, right. or did we just believe that because all the science was done by wannabe alpha male scientists <laughs> back then? That was an interesting thought. I mean, the the alpha idea has been what I think of as a really sticky concept in in um, cognitive science in the popular imagination. We like the alpha dog idea. The it comes from research in the fifties. Uh, by a single researcher who was looking at... Was it a man? It was a man, mm -hmm. looking at the dynamics of wolf population in captivity. And, these, and the population he looked at were adolescent wolves that were all captive. Maybe they were um, caught and couldn't be returned to the wild. And he looked at how they interacted with each other. He did a great ethological study of them. And the way he described their behavior at the time was that there was an alpha dog who was kind of in charge of who got to breed, who got to eat first, him when people got better at and, and technology got better to study wolves in the wild, although you can still talk about an alpha dog in um, a group, in a pack, it's, it's not um, a fight for the top of the pack at all. That was a population of adolescent male wolves. Like, imagine putting a bunch of adolescent boys in a small uh, place. They're going to wrestle. I think that might have been Lord of, Lord, of the, <laughs> Lord of the Flies, right? That Lord is of Lord of the Flies. Of the flies. Yeah. So... Um, they're going to wrestle. Somebody's going to be bigger. Someone's going to be weaker. It's just a social dynamic, but it's not a canid dynamic per se. In the wild, packs have an alpha, but that's kind of the parents. Like, we're the alphas. Okay. I feel like this is huge news. Oh, it's huge. So, so and for some reason, it hasn't... Let's make this clear. The <laughs> alpha dog thing. It's not real, right? No, no. There's no struggle for dominance between wolves in a pack. So that alpha idea then gets extended like an Isle of Dogs so that there are many alphas. Really all they mean is, is just a bunch of confident dogs. Um, and that's a personality thing, not a social hierarchy thing. In Isle of Dogs, there's also this scene where a pack of nearly identical dogs square off against our hero dogs, who are a bunch of mixed mutts. Do packs of dogs gravitate towards sameness? I mean, do different breeds kind of like to be around their own? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question because, and I don't think it's been well researched. Um, when I did my very first study of dogs was studying dogs in graduate school um, in social play, what we'd call dyadic, interspecific play, where they're playing with each other, just like the thing you see when you go to a dog park and they're playing with each other. And I was interested in, in, in slowing down that dance that dogs do when they play with each other and seeing what the dynamics were within it. And one of the things I noticed um, was that like dogs played often better with each other than unlike dogs. So you had two Weimaraners, they could have a great play session the way that sometimes, not like mismatched dogs couldn't, they also, you know, a Great Dane can play with, with a ch terrier, <laughs> absolutely. But the Weimaraners or the two Ridgebacks or two similar size shaped dogs often play together better. I haven't pursued it and I don't think anybody else has yet, but I think that there are ways that the cues from a similar looking dog, it wouldn't have to be the same breed, um, but are easier to read. 
by oneself, someone who was because, sort of like one. So it's not, if I understand you, it's, you're thinking that maybe it's because they're, they're similarly shaped, so they, see the, they literally see the world at the same level, then that, don't dogs mostly all have the same interests? Like run around, sniff butts, hump legs, roll around, <laughs> bark, right? Jump, catch a frisbee. As a, as a subset, yeah, sure. I mean, I am saying that partially, so there are some dogs who have no tails, for instance, because we've bred them without tails or their tails are really tightly coiled, so they don't, they're not as expressive with their tails. They might use different features for expression. Ears are very expressive, the mouth is expressive, body posture is expressive. All these are communicative devices between dogs. So if you have two dogs who have the kind of same tools to communicate, uh -huh. it might be that they can communicate better. It could also be that owners also like, you know, wine runner owners or gravitate toward other wine runner owners and so they just get the occasion to interact with each other more often and therefore play better. I think you said that this area hasn't really been studied about whether, a lot, about whether dogs like to play with like right. breeds. Right. And don't you think that, I'm, I mean, if you can extrapolate non-human behavior to, to human, if it points to something in the way we act as humans, don't you think that deserves more study? I, I mean, honestly, I feel like I would be disturbed to learn that dogs want to be with their own, because I don't like how that would, might be applied to human yeah. culture. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that. I mean, a lot of the reasons we study dog behavior, the uh, comparative psychology, uh, for instance, is looking at the difference between human and non-human ways of thinking. And sometimes we study the non-human ways of thinking to learn more about our own way of thinking. I very much study just to learn about the non-human way of thinking. Oh, really? Yeah, very much I'm interested in what it's like to be that dog. I would love to understand, you know, what's the dog's perspective when I stop putting my own ideas into the dog's head and see the dog as behaving according to human terms. You know, what's it to be like for the dog? And in that sense, I think, you know, breeds might not be so importantly different for, for dogs. They might notice differences in breeds and it's easier to communicate with some that, uh, rather than others. But I mean, and, and, and maybe that is a good model for human interaction, that you can... You can there sniff might be, anybody's butt. Absolutely, as long as, uh, as, long you as let them consent. sniff them back. <laughs> That's right. Um, the movie Isle of Dogs has given dogs, like d different breeds of dogs, these kind of s stereotypical personalities, yes. right? So the Newfoundlands and the labs talk slowly and the, yes. and the um, poodles are glamorous yeah, and the yeah. terriers are excited. Are there... Are there breeds that have, I mean, do breeds have personalities? Mm. Well, all dogs have personalities and distinctive, I would say individual personalities. Okay. Um, within breeds, breed types are described as having personalities. So the American Kennel Club um, designates groups for each type of dog, for the Labrador, for the Newfoundland. And those groups say, this is what the classic example of a Labrador would be. You know, it's a friendly, outgoing, responsive dog. Is that um, fair to say? Can you generalize? I would say there are definitely differences, but that it's wrong to think that therefore, um, you know, in some of the descriptions of personality differences are this is a very proud dog. I think that has more to do with our way of thinking about the dog per se than the individuals within that breed. Group. Right, because I'm picturing whatever dog looks like this, right, a pointer or whatever, but yes. when you cannot describe a bulldog as like a proud dog because it's like drooling and like has no but that's just the right. human way of right. thinking about it. Right, we're anthropomorphizing Absolutely right. I remember one of the, AK, the breed standard descriptions for terrier was something like, always on the tiptoe of expectation. And you think, well, I mean, that's a very nice way of talking about how we view a little terrier, which might be dancing around and waiting for the next little rat that's going to run by or something. But within terriers, there's going to be a really wide range of temperamental differences, personality differences. And the variability within a breed is often more than the variability between breeds. There's an animated show called Rick and Morty, and in one episode, the character Summer wants her dog Snuffles to be a little more intelligent, just, just enough so he can understand her commands. But Summer is a teenager, and she doesn't monitor the intelligence granting machine, and of course, it goes too far. And she wakes up to find her dog has become self-aware, has changed his name to Snowball, and wants to know, where are my testicles, Summer? <laughs> In real life, are dogs self-aware? <laughs> First, I think that's a very funny bit. Like, you know, it is, a, it is a puzzling thing that we do to dogs, and it's funny that dogs never get to be part of that equation. There, 
it's a really interesting question as a psychologist whether other animals have a sense of themselves. So I actually did a little olfactory test of self-recognition where I presented them with sort of their own smell and their own smell changed like that mark to see if they'd notice the difference um, and they did. Hmm. They did notice the difference. So I think they do have a kind of least rudimentary self-awareness. They might not be thinking of themselves, my dog Finnegan, it might not be sitting around thinking, I'm Finnegan and here's what I'm about and here's what I want to do. But <laughs> I think he is aware of himself, his body in space, how he interacts with others, others' responsiveness to him, where he is in the family. I think he's thinking about himself in some way. That Rick and Morty summer quote has generated a million memes, almost as many as the guilty dog meme or video. In all those guilty dog videos, are those looks really dog guilt? I, I also studied this because I was myself interested in if whether we could say something about the emotional state of dogs, that they experience guilt, which is a very complex emotion, yeah. by this look, and certainly looks very, they look very guilty. Um, and so I did a little study where they, we had owners come in with their dogs and put a treat in front of them and, and tell them not to eat the treat and then the owner leaves the room. And when they're gone, the dog either eats the treat or doesn't, right? They eat some, eat There the, are dogs that don't eat the treat? Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. Wow. Their dogs will stay there for many, many minutes and not eat the treat because they've been told not to. And they know the repercussion. And then I'd have the people come back in and I would either, you know, if the dog had eaten the treat, I would say he ate it, and they were asked to scold their dog however they usually do, which usually like, you ate that treat. Um, and if they didn't eat the treat, I was saying, oh, just come in and greet them. They didn't eat the treat. And so they would come in and greet them. But sometimes I misled the owner. So when the dog ate the treat and was guilty of violating this request by the owner, I told the owners, actually, they didn't eat it. And so they got a big greeting by the owner. And sometimes when the dog didn't eat the treat, was a good dog, I said to the owner, they ate it. And so they would get scolded by their owner. And I was looking at how much of that guilty look the dogs put on in all those situations. If it was because of guilt that they'd eaten the treat, only the dogs who ate the treat would look guilty. Yeah. But it wasn't like that. They looked the same whether they ate it or not. What made them look different was if the owner scolded them, whether they had eaten it or not. It's a response to owner behavior. And it's a learned response. Dogs don't put on this look right away. You know, puppies don't have this look, they learn it. They're listening to our tone of voice. We get mad, some people hit their dogs. Whatever it is, they get sent to the corner. And this expression they put on is a submissive expression, an appealing gesture, I would call it an appeasement, to say like, listen, like I can see you're getting mad. Like, Please don't get mad. So it's, it's not a moral response. We want, our human minds tend to want to go there. It is, it is in, in its way, a smart response because it's like, I don't want the person around whom my, my world revolves to be mad at me. So I'm yes. going to give you this look. Yes, and I believe that dogs are extremely responsive to us, very sensitive to our behavior, little canine anthropologists in our house. But that doesn't mean that therefore they are humans just wearing a furry, no. you know, quadrupedal costume. They don't have our same sense of morality. I'm sure they have senses of good or bad things to do, absolutely. But a lot of that they learn about what, I mean, we learn, humans learn that too, right? I don't think kids feel they have an impulse to do something that it's wrong until they're told it's wrong and then eventually they're told actually there's a system of rights and right. wrongs and here's how we behave in this type of culture, this type of society. Well, dogs are not going to grow into that level. That doesn't mean they ha don't have senses that things are better or worse or good or bad or things you do or don't do to each other, but they don't have our sense that it, you know, they should feel guilty for eating a piece of food that's in front of them or or eating your, uh, all your laundry when you've left them all alone with nothing to do all day, you know? From Lassie to Rin Tin Tin to Toto to Snoopy to Brian Griffin, we love seeing dogs on TV. But until recently, dogs could not see TV. Really? Right. So Lassie, Lassie could not have <laughs> seen himself, herself on herself? TV? Right. Her, save the day? Yes, right. When, when, before digital TV, um, you know, TV operated by sending out lots of signals, and the, the eye would, it was at, generated at a pace that the eye would reconstruct it 
um, as a moving image in the brain. So like an old movie slowed down, you see the lines between the frames. Our eyes operate um, by taking about 60 snapshots per second. Like it's called the flicker fusion rate. And anything um, above 60, we see as continuous motion. Anything below, we start to see the lines between the frames. Dogs have a higher flicker fusion rate than we do. So television ran on that ca same kind of principle. They would have seen flickering television screens. You could still see some of it, but you wouldn't watch it. You would try to find another channel. <laughs> um, mm. And because their eyes are functioning at a slightly different level than we are, they probably see flickering and fluorescent lights. I think there are a lot of little perceptual differences like that between dogs so and human eyes. Around what year could dogs start watching TV? Well, with digital TVs. So I feel like when was that? 2000, you know, the 1990s, something like that. Oh my gosh, they missed all those great, they yeah. missed Family Ties, <laughs> they missed MASH. Until they have oh. an olfactory TV, I'm not sure that it's going to be hugely interesting <laughs> to dogs. Olfactory TV, I think you've invented the next great thing. Something that no owner will ever want to have, but every dog would want to watch. All right, so I won't argue with Uncle Juan, who <laughs> the dog walker who says that we should leave on uh, European football for, <laughs> for my husband's dog to watch all the time. Um, Alexandra. Dog on it, we're out of time. I'm so glad you came because I feel like I should probably go home and hug my husband's dog. Your who dog. will Your shed dog. all over me, but that's okay. Yes, um, Thank you. My pleasure, thanks Faith.